Good afternoon to all. I'm glad we are all safe and well. Just a little more introduction about me and my two other colleagues who have put together this presentation. I'm Doris Day. Yes, I manage a portfolio of outsourcing and business advisory. Prior to Incorp, I held a number of top finance positions with listed companies and SMEs. Mr. Paul Tan, Senior Director of our Outsourcing and Advisory Division. He was the founding partner of CA Trust Group, an audit tax advisory services firm. Mr. Eric Chin, our Chief Business Development Officer. He provides consultancy services to companies for setting up businesses locally and expanding operations into Southeast Asia. Singapore Budget 2020. Many of us must have read this multiple times. I will allude briefly to the main points in the next few slides, but it shall not be our focus today. We knew about the 63.7 or 63.8 billion support packages that will bring an overall deficit budget of 47.1 billion for FY2020. The key to these measures is they are tailored to help viable businesses to overcome immediate challenges. I have put here links to the three budgets if you wish to understand in details. A few points on the budget. First, there are those that are employee-based. It auto-inclusive unless your company falls under the exclusion list job support scheme on local employees, subsidy of 75% on April and May's wages, up to 4006 and 25% to 75% on wages, up to 4006 for the remaining seven months, depending on the industry sector. Based on the announcement on 21st April, the JSS has also included employees who are directors, and shareholders of the company with accessible income of less than 100,000 for YA2019. Your company should by now receive the first payment and the other three payouts are expected to be in May for the enhanced JSS, July and October. The foreign workers levy grants waiver for April and May's payment and $750 rebate for each work permit and S pass holder for April and May 2020. Are some cost savings measures, the property tax rebates between 30% to 100% depending on the property type, and rent waivers for one to three months if you are on government properties. You might want to pursue with your landlord. However, please note, if your lease is on a non-government com commercial properties, the refund is only on the property tax and not the full rent. There are a number of government assisted financing schemes that are managed by Enterprise Singapore. In particular, Singapore government has increased its share of risk to 90% for the temporary bridging loan and the enterprise financing schemes. This is for loans applications initiated from 8 April to 31st March 2021. MAS will provide funding at almost zero cost to eligible financial institutions for two-year tenure in a move to support the lending to SMEs. We can therefore expect interest rates by these banks to be reduced. However, please note, these financing schemes are structured to assist local companies with a fiscal presence in Singapore and at least 30% local shareholdings. There are also other schemes available, which you can assess information via the link. For companies looking at expanding out of Singapore, you may be able to tap on this, the following grants. Market readiness assisting grants up to 70% of eligible cost. Get a cap at 100,000 per company, per new market, from 1st April 2020 to 31st March 2023. This is to cover overseas market promotions. 
business development, and market setup costs. Mark Enterprise Development Grant to help Singapore companies grow and transform. This supports projects undertaken by companies in three areas. Core capabilities to strengthen business foundations for growth, innovation and productivity to explore new areas of growth and redesign workflow and processes to enhance efficiency, and three, market access to, market access to venture overseas. International co-innovation program cross, for cross-border collaboration projects on technology, development, and co-innovation. The details of these grants can be found in the Enterprise Singapore's website. These are all I want to highlight about Budget 2020. The next section of this presentation is what companies can do for themselves. Instead of just praising reliance on the government to survive COVID-19. So what, what should we do things? First, conduct financial monitoring of your business. Sorry, um, so what, what is crucial and important that as a business owner to ensure viability and sustainability of your business during this period of time. If there is any CFO or head of finance in this forum, please assist to articulate what is presented here to your business owners. Your voice is critical during this period. We can't stress enough of the following. Keep track of your financial health. Consider forward action plans. Re-examine your risk, which potentially leads to crisis, and be ready to manage them. Change is part of our lives. Business must be able to adapt. So what should we do next? Step one, financial modeling. Conduct financial modeling of your business based on today's market condition. This step is applicable to holding company or subsidiary companies irrespective of where they are incorporated or where the operations are conducted. Please remind that this is not an accounting exercise. It is really a, using accounting information as management tools. I do strongly encourage you to engage your finance personnel. Take stock of your financial position today. That is, understand your assets and liabilities. Know what is in there. This will show you your immediate gap if there is. Next, do a projection of your profit and loss till end of this year and next year. COVID-19 has changed the way businesses are carried out. We have been reminded that recovery will not be quick and strong bounce back. It may be a U-shape or W-shape is everyone's guess. As such, we need to see beyond this year. In fact, we need to monitor the impact for month to month. Perform the projection on segment basis in terms of products or services or geographical region. You know best the revenue drivers of your business. Do it on a month to month basis, if not at least on a quarter to quarter basis, as the extent of impact of COVID 19 changes over time. Segregate your cost into direct variable direct fix, indirect variable, and indirect fix. This is extremely important for manufacturing setup to understand your total fixed cost. Consider all secured contracts at hand and potential loss sales due to COVID-19. Ask if extra expenses are needed to be incurred. Take into account all known government schemes available, be it Singapore or any countries where eligible. After knowing what is expected from sales and expenses, translate these figures to cash flow requirements for the same period. And again, consider all impact that could be caused by COVID-19. During the circuit breaker, as well as immediately thereafter, again, please do not expect businesses to resume to normalcy right after the release of the circuit breaker. Anticipate possible delays or receipts 
of in or non-payments from distressed debtors. Consider the possibility of stretching the credit terms from suppliers. Stocks tied up cash flow and hence review its necessity. In Singapore context, consider the possible deferment of tax payments or contractor payments if forced under the COVID-19 temporary measures. By now, you should have a good knowledge of your financial risk by the end of the year as well as the following year. Step two, review the relevant key performance indicators. The, re the, re the following are some common and critical ones that require appropriate action. Sales growth, gross margin for each business segment. In the current state, I would think that most businesses are suffering a decline in sales. How about gross profit margin? You can review the gross profit in two aspects, after direct variable costs and after direct costs. What is the break-even point today? It is unlikely to be the same as before. Operating expenses. Apply the 80-20 rule. Focus on the top three to five cost drivers. Get your team together and see where reductions are possible. Cash flow, current ratio and quick ratio. This shows the ability of the company to meet immediate cash demands. How long can your current cash flow last? What is your cash break even point? Cash conversion days, or also known as cash cycle. How long the company takes to convert its investments in, in, in inventory into cash flow from sales. Improvement in cash flow, debtor turnover days or creditor days will positively impact the cash flow of your company. Gearing ratios, long-term debt to equity ratio, current debt to equity ratio. If the company is highly geared, it will hinder the company's ability to restructure existing debts or obtain new external financing. Step three, after obtaining an in-depth understanding of your financial situation today, the next thing to do is to analyze the impact on your, on your business profitability and cash flow. If the current economic climate worsen, or if the projections you made earlier cannot be realized. The prolonged effect of COVID-19 is likely to cause many companies to be so distressed and may not be able to bounce back when the virus is contained. And these companies may be your debtors. You may have to work from the, you may have to work with the rest of your executive team to develop a, a wide range of possible outcomes and a financial plan that will help your company to survive. As such, it is important to engage in scenario planning. I have put here a plus and a less one percent. You can change the percentage to suit your business environment. From time to time, ask yourself what is the impact to your break-even point. Step four, explore all possible actions with an aim to improve profit and cash flow. We have listed below some measures for your consideration. At each business entity level, alignment of resources and capacity. Review gross profit margins at, of each business sector. Identify products, services that have higher margins. This should be where most of the company's resources be allocated to. Be innovative. Understand the needs of your customers. Introduce new products or services as a total solution to increase revenue or even margin. Explore digitalization using social media engagement to reach out to customers, collaborations with other businesses to drive sales. Some real cases that we have. We have a client that supplies certain materials in the construction industry. To increase profitability, the owner looked into integrated solution for its existing customers. Today, they are looking for potential investors to fund the company to expand this new line of business by investing into automation equipment to keep labor costs at, at an optimal level. On the point of digitalization, 
We have an F&B client running an Italian restaurant, serving, servicing high-end customers. Went online at the start of COVID-19 and is able to achieve good level of revenue during this time. The owner agreed much time is expended to fight the storm, but they could at least sustain the business, keep their customers till the situation eases. I also know of some I sorry, I also know of some F and B owners that came together to offer customers a wider variety of food options on a single online platform. Customers' choices enlarged and saved on delivery cost. We are working with IMDA on a Go Digital program. If you are keen with any digitalization solution, we may be able to connect you with the pre-approved online solution vendors who will be able to assist you and possibly tapping on some existing grants available. Cost controls measures. A dollar saved is a dollar earned. Do not just focus on salary cuts and retrenchment. Human resource is your, car, is your company's asset. And as a matter of fact, you need good employees now to bring your business through this rough period. Analyze your top three to five fixed costs instead. Convert fixed costs to variable costs. Renegotiate commercial terms of the existing contracts. Get your team on the ground involved. Evaluate if these costs are necessary for your survival. We look at process re-engineering for productivity improvements. Contemplate the possibility of deploying cloud-based solutions. Inventory management and credit management. Step up collections. Consider giving a small discount to boost collection from long overdue customers. Contemplate the possibility of advanced collection. Maximize credit term and drag up payments to creditors if possible. Consider using credits, letters of credits for sourcing new materials. Restructure existing debts to get some breathing space. Initial talks with the bankers. With the existing global wide lockdown, banks are more prepared to listen if there is a viable business. From the holding company perspective, review the possibility of relocating operate production or certain functions of your group companies within your group companies. Cash flow support can be within the group companies via intercompany borrowings. Consider dividends from profitable subsidiaries to holding company. Loan, a number of further considerations to be discussed in my next few slides. Fundraising through capital injection, mergers and acquisitions. We are of the view that if you have a business with good revenue model, go for M&A now for expansion to grow the value of your business. If you have a viable business but with limited cash flow, go for M&A to sustain the business and look up for future opportunity. If you have a business that is not so viable, still consider M&A to find an investor that your business may have synergy value to them, even if this value may not be, uh, may not be significant. Please note, when considering liquidation as an option, the cost of voluntary liquidation can be higher than expected. It involves laying off compensations and may unduly attract creditors' attention, in addition to the cost of engaging a creditor, a, a liquidator to assist you on the process. Loans, external financing, before deciding on the loan to apply. Please consider the following. The type of loan that best suits the company. Bearing in mind that in general, short-term loan, faster cash, but higher interest with shorter repayment period. Fixed assets loan, collateral based, therefore a charge is necessary and can, can have a longer tenor. Invoicing financing, if a significant portion of your assets are trade receivables. These are cash advances against receivables and improved cash flow immediately. Source of funding is important. 
explore the possibility of tapping on the credit assistance schemes provided by Singapore government. If you have subsidiaries in overseas, consider financing from these countries for the lowest cost of borrowings, but take into account foreign risk, foreign exchange risk or exposure if there is in the company borrowing thereafter. How much should you borrow? Please be mindful not to run into an over-borrowing situation as borrowing comes with the cost and put the company at higher risk and regularly conduct self-check to avoid over-reliance on external financing. There may be some point in time when NMA makes better option. In order to be confident that the new loan will tie the company over this unprecedented difficult period of time, Revise your financial modeling that was done in step one. Incorporate the new funds and, co and consider if there is any potential upside to revenue and interest costs. Review your financial position again. You have to repeat this until you see that the new loan and quantum is indeed the right decision to pursue. You may want to note some of the essential information typically required from banks in Singapore. Personal guarantee from directors with more than 5% shareholdings. So please ensure that the loan is able to tie the business over this extremely extended difficult period. Corporate guarantee if parent company holds more than 50% shareholdings. Financial statements not older than 18 months. From liquidity viewpoint, a minimum current ratio of 1%. From profitability viewpoint, a EBITDA over interest of at least one and being, and being profitable for the past one to three years. From business viability, bankers who require some forms of financial projections. And in the case of a temporary bridging loan, a high level of projections for three years is required. What I mentioned above are typical requirements. However, if you do not meet any of the above, it does not mean that you are automatically ruled out. Start engaging your bankers, especially if you have a good business model, or preposition, or innovation ideas that can create value to your company. Please constantly review your management accounts. It is important you keep it up to date. And should any of the following signs surface, it calls for an immediate attention. Negative or declined gross profit margin at company level or product level. Review your business model. Ask further if a temporary skill down or scrapping off a product line is necessary. Negative working capital. Assuming there is still profit, then seek external funding or M&A immediately. Please do not wait until profitability becomes an issue. High gearing ratio. Do not expect any further external funding from banks, not even the assisting, assisted schemes from the government. If there is a business model, engage investors immediately. Net liability position. Please beware of insolvent trading. Although there may be some space of relief during COVID-19. We must accept that Virtually every organization, from the neighborhood bubble shop to many multinational corporations, will have a different business model when the new world emerged. So as you tackle the Im immediate challenges, it may be good for you to reinvent your organization from the ground up and be able to reposition your business in the new reality. Before I end today's session, I would like to add some final words about income. At Incorp, we are fully aware that our customer is unique and has its unique business needs. We have a team of qualified chartered accountants, company secretaries, business advisors, all well equipped to assist you in your transactions. You can find details of our comprehensive corporate services via www.incorp.asia. This is Doris Day from Incorp. I thank you taking time to join me today and I hope you have benefited in some way from this session. 
I shall pass the mic to Stephanie. Okay, can you share? Thanks, Doris. Okay, um, you know, next time we're going to have a QA and a uh, session. Uh, but before we start, for those who would like to receive the, uh, just like to know, uh, let the participants know that for those who would like to receive the presentation deck, okay, please take some time to scan the QR code on the screen right now to fill up your contact details. And after you have completed the form, the presentation deck will be sent to you a few days later after you know, uh, we have edit the slides, okay? But I understand that some of y'all may be saying that, hey, you know, I'm using my handphone now, you know, to view the Zoom, so I'm not able to scan the QR code. Rest ensure that after the whole event, okay, uh, SCCCI will also be sending out an uh, email, and in the email, we also be guiding you guys how to receive this presentation deck. So, uh, you know, without further ado, for those who have Q&A, please uh, help to, you know, post your questions uh, by clicking on the Q&A uh, icon below. As now, we would like to also invite uh, Doris um, for the Q&A session back. And apart from Doris, we also have with us today, Mr. Eric Ching, Chief Business Development Officer of Business Development and Incorporation Advisory. And Mr. Paul Tan, Senior Director of Outsourcing and Advisory Division of Incorp Global, joining us today for the Q&A session. So um, as mentioned, for those participants who have any, you know, dying questions that you are facing at the current moment with your businesses that you would like, you know, our team of expertise from Incorp Global to be able to answer you, please feel free to key in, you know, your inquiries at the Q&A session. Um, but do bear with us that, you know, certain questions, if we are not able to, you know, answer you guys, especially with a limited number of time, you know, we will compile the questions, okay, and for those who did not answer the Q&A as under anonymous, we'll be able to reply you accordingly, okay? So, uh, rest ensure for some of the questions we are not able to answer today, we will try to reply you after the webinar session too, okay? So, um, you know, um, we are still waiting for a few of the Q&A questions coming in, but, you know, offhand, I do have some participants who always, uh, you know, contact us and would like to find out more, you know, currently with the COVID-19 situation, you know, due to the uh, circuit breaker, especially in Singapore, especially some of the business, they are, their revenue is being impacted, you know, um, badly during this period. So maybe um, Doris, Paul or Eric, can you advise some of the SMEs, especially for those businesses who are being impacted very badly, you know, what other business strategies can they adopt, you know, to build up maybe more revenue channels? Like maybe do they look at their business innovations? What can they look on to move forward and, you know, not just by sitting at home and just waiting for the city to be over? Yeah, so over to you guys. Um, okay, maybe maybe I'll just go first, but I'm sure Eric will be able to give his uh, take as well as uh, uh, his slant of it. Uh, if we are going a bit generic, as in like what kind of uh, ideas can I have? Then generically, I and and most of these has been covered by Doris in uh, in her slides as well as um, in her presentations, but. I thought it would be good for everybody who's thinking of ideas, then you think along these uh, generic ways. Number one, same product, different channels. And different channels, Doris have mentioned, we are talking about maybe online uh, digitalization. If you are in services, then all the more you should go online. So different channels. Same product, different infrastructure. I know it's easier said than done, especially when you talk about infrastructure, but this would apply to those who are sort of benefiting, if you like, from this COVID-19. And especially if you're talking about the courier services, the uh, last mile delivery of uh, e-commerce. Uh, but then when you're facing a boom and May, may not be temporary boom. Uh, we are talking about then how do I ramp up in a very short period of time uh, manpower. Then you might want to do collaboration. So same product, I'm, I, I'm, I'm facing a boom time, but how do I uh, change my infrastructure in that sense? How do I ramp up my manpower in this particular case? So you might want to look at collaborations with those companies uh, with a lot of manpower, but but having some problems. Uh, uh, 
uh, a case in point which you might have read would be some of the airlines uh, steward and stewardess are reskilling temporarily uh, to go into medical. Uh, MOH is ramping up their, their recruitment as an example. Okay? Uh, and last but not least, uh, different products but using the same infrastructure. So, so again, uh, for those who have been reading about this, you would have read about companies that are able to quickly adapt when they see that all these are being shut down, uh, but still using their factories and all that, their, their equipments uh, to make face masks, to make hand sanitizers, uh, that, that kind of stuff, you know, uh, that, is, that is needed for, for uh, the COVID-19. Uh, how do you adapt quickly? Uh, we, we, we literally have got car manufacturers, uh, Dyson, the famous uh, James Dyson has actually within a very short period of time come out with ventilators and they never actually manufactured ventilators. So these are the three generic ways that you can think along. Uh, I'm not sure if that helps, but uh, hopefully that helps to, to, for some of you all. Okay, thanks, Paul. I think in general, um, each and every business is a bit different. The models is a bit different. So, you know, they probably have to look into deep into their resources and what they can tap on, who can they partner with, like what Doris have said, you know. Maybe try to brainstorm during this period, especially when we are at home, you know, we have, we have the time to think about what is next for the businesses at the end of the day. Okay, so maybe I'll, uh, thanks, Paul. So maybe I'd like to uh, move forward to some of the questions that, you know, people are asking uh, at the current moment. Uh, we do have attendees. I think it's, um, it's a problem about SMEs that, you know, now a lot of loan is available for them. So one of the company, the questions about them is that there's a large sum of loans available for their company. But how would you advise them to know how much should they take? What are the pros and cons of overborrowing? And on the other hand, also worry that they underborrow. So maybe is there any best practices or ben uh, benchmark that maybe Doris uh, or Eric, you all can share on like how to evaluate how much loans should the SME go about and if they over borrow, what should they do or if they under borrow or how to go about it in life. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Tiffany. Maybe I'll take this question uh, sure. first. So um, in the interim of um, when do you justify over borrowing, under borrowing in the case of uh, as you understand, if you borrow from a bank, right, the bank lends you the principal sum and you will need to return or, or repay back to the bank the principal and interest. So even for all these government-backed loans um, that uh, the Interpress Singapore or Singapore government has uh, been working for the banks here on trying to give uh, very attractive loan schemes to all SMEs, there is still an interest element to it. So in the overborrowing perspective, if you over borrow, then what you need, say for your business or cash flow for uh, inventory, stocking up, etc., where you just need a million dollars, but you borrow two million dollars just for safety sake. But take note that uh, depending on the type of loans that you, you uh, 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 draw down, say the temporary bridging loans, right, which is draw down in full, uh, you will be, you'll be paying in full uh, two million dollars of interest, where in actual fact you only need one million dollars. So in this case, we will not advise for obvious reasons to overborrow, and and I think on the perspective of underborrow, there is no such thing as the underborrow. As long as your business can support existing cash flow, you can pay all your employees, which is important. You can continue to function the business as it is. There's no such thing as underborrow. When uh, cash flow wise becomes negative, that means the amount of uh, incoming or receivables coming is more than the amount that you're going to uh, make in terms of payables. Then in this case, yes, you have uh, in, uh, in a, a negative cash flow. You may need to borrow to top up this cash flow uh, difference. But I, I think at the end of the day, we have to think about the interest payments that you have to make back um, to the banks, uh, as well as when you come to the overborrowing perspective, uh, uh, if you cannot repay at all, right, because business becomes worse and worse, um, you might you might get into trouble with the banks, and the banks will start calling on the on the loans. Yeah? So this is something that SME should uh, look out for. 
Okay, thanks, Eric. I think at the end of the day, um, each individual company should see what's the main purpose that they want because some of the companies understand that they're also looking to expansions, you know, to see, you know, what's the main purpose of their borrowing at the end of the day. So thanks, Eric, for answering. I hope that uh, answers one of the questions uh, by our participants. Okay, next up, okay, I do have another com uh, company, uh, you know, this saying that Currently, his company is doing some simplified tax filing. It's more on tax related, okay? If they were to take a loan from the bank, are they still eligible for simplified tax filing? So any of you guys can help to answer on this question? Um, okay. I, I think the simplified tax filing or, or even the, which is called Form CS and Form C uh, has uh, no, no link to uh, whether you have an existing loans. I think a bit more relevant, a little bit more relevant could be uh, whether your financial statements needs to be audited. If you were to uh, go ahead and, and borrow money, but uh, insofar as I understand, uh, unlike say uh, in the earlier days when all the exemptions came about, um, not, not all bankers or rather uh, many bankers are now not insisting on audited financial statements anymore. Uh, but still, if, if the quantum is big or it depends quite a lot on the bankers, but, but in so far as I understand, it's not that uh, critical anymore to get your financial statements audited. Okay, Ken, sure. Thanks, Paul. I hope that uh, helps to answer uh, on the tax filing of one of the participants down here. I think uh, mainly it's also to ask your banks, you know, uh, previously we have quite a, Singapore Chinese Chamber has, um, you know, quite a few uh, uh, events on working with the different banks. So for any of you guys who have any questions regarding on the loans area for the banks, uh, you know, feel free to drop Singapore Chinese Chamber an email. We will try to assist you out by forwarding to the relevant banks. Okay, so moving forward, right? Next up, I do have another um, question by Sing Lu. Uh, okay, I think this question uh, is more on for the job support scheme. So his question is, if the accessible income for, you know, year 2019 is more than 100,000, but AI for, um, you know, year 2020 is less than 100,000, would the job support scheme be applicable for the director? So maybe I think what he's trying to say is that, you know, I think it's more of a cut-off timing, you know, is there anything on the cut-off timing date that they have to look into it so as to know that whether will, will they be eligible for the job support scheme? Basically, YA2019 is actually dictated by the government when they roll out this enhanced JSS. Um, we will not be in a position to say that it can be applicable, but we, we can suggest that you can write in um, to make an appeal. Um, if you want to, if, if really YA2000, the, the, the assessable income has, spawned, uh, has fallen below 100,000. So we are really not in a position to, to say yes, but we are saying that Give it a try. Okay, thanks. Sure. I hope that's our uh, answer, you know, Sing Lun. I think there's only a certain limitation that, you know, INCORP can able to assist you, but, but for certain grants and everything, probably you have to check with the relevant uh, government agencies at the end of the day. Okay, so maybe in the next up, uh, we have another question by this SME. He's saying that, you know, how can SME do or what can they do if they're already making a loss on negative net worth value and short of fund. Okay, I, I think we need to be clear, you know, when COVID-19 happened and if you, because of COVID-19, you start to making loss, you know, and versus that before that, you know, before COVID-19, you're making loss. So basically, you also want to know, like, is there any government support for SMEs can adopt down here? So uh, maybe Doris or Eric, you can help to, you know, navigate which are the government support, as, you know, that SMEs can adopt with. I think the question of, uh, you see, I, I look at your situation, you are in a very bad, bad situation. You're making loss, negative net worth, which, which means that you continue to trade, you're actually in, in, in a, in, in a uh, insolvent trading, and you also short of funds. So, um, I think that the, the list of government support, I think you, we can actually refer back to our, the, the three links that we have provided. Um, first, you also need to understand whether you, you are, part of the, you, do you have a 30% local shareholdings? Um, and of course, on, the look, the, on those that are employee-based uh, schemes, you are automatically given. 
so what I suggest to do is really do your modeling and ascertain whether you can really bring forward this business or effectively you should actually consider M&A and look for investors to come in if there is a business model. You have okay. anything to add on? Uh, okay, uh, maybe I maybe agree with Doris. Uh, uh, Paul, okay, go ahead. Uh, well, okay, uh, I'll, 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 keep, I'll, I'll keep it very short. Uh, basically, I wanted to say that uh, do, do really be, uh, do, do consider that if you are, you, you might actually be insolvent already, you should not continue uh, trading or doing business because uh, in the eyes of the law, if you already know, or you have indications that you might be insolvent and you continue to do business, uh, some of the liabilities, even though you are, you are carrying on your business under a private, uh, limited liability company, uh, that corporate veil, that limited liability corporate veil might be limited and therefore you might be personally liable. So uh, that's why Doris was also suggesting that you might really want to look into M&A, uh, uh, collaborating, selling some of your stake or bringing in a friendly investors uh, kind of stuff rather than uh, going into more loans, uh, especially when in this environment, the bankers are still requiring all the personal guarantees uh, that, that the directors and shareholders would, would have to give. So, so that's what I wanted to say, uh, Eric. Uh, I think uh, Paul and Doris have covered a lot of the points that I've talked about. I think getting investor money uh, is something SMEs can consider, but uh, barring the fact that you know, your business must be an investable business, it's not a business that is uninvestable uh, in that sense. Um, the second portion that you can think about in terms of bank loans, I think besides the government back loans, which a lot of SMEs are considering now because they see that you know, government is backing 90% risk, there are existing bank products um, that may be able to help you even if your balance sheet and p and doesn't look very good. So there are loan products such as invoice financing or factory, uh, which is an unnamed cost whereby you essentially sell your sales invoices from good uh, debtors to the bank and the bank finance you on your sales. So in fact, for the banks, the risk of this is one of the lowest because they may be able to get credit insurance uh, using this product uh, to you. So in this case, do talk to your existing bankers, whether on the factoring uh, or invoice financing type of loans, whether this is something that can still be explored. Yeah? So don't be too fixated on government back loans um, first, because this is, they are only just one option. There's a whole array of uh, instruments that the banks may still be able to um, uh, fulfill that uh, cash gap uh, that you might have. Okay, thanks, Eris. Uh, thank, thanks, Eric. You know, I hope that uh, answers on, you know, uh, for the SMEs uh, participants down there. And talking about, you know, looking at the bank loans, okay, I, I do have quite a number of SMEs, you know. Um, you know, whenever it comes to taking on bank loans, you know, maybe you can guide them through, besides for them to have these financial statements, to boost, uh, you know, financial statements, you know, to get the bank loans. What other things maybe or factors, you know, that can help them to boost their chances of obtaining a bank loan? Like what are the things that they can look into it, especially when now with the COVID-19 here, you know, for them to produce a p &L, it may not be looked that glamorous at the end of the day. So maybe over to you guys, maybe you all can, you know, help the SMEs out in this period. Mm. Yeah. Um, so Tiffany, your question is, uh, the question is, uh, how, how can SMEs uh, boost their chances of getting the bank loan? Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah? Yes. So I, I guess for all the participants here today, uh, because I'm a corporate banker for 10 over years as well, uh, I've sat on the bank side. So bankers typically like, number one, they like to deal with existing clients with a track record with them, right? So this gives you some brownie points. Number two, obviously your financials must be in order. So for SMEs who do not audit their accounts, because statutory-wise, you do not need to audit your account, you must ensure that you have a good finance manager or CFO who does a good job in doing your books, or you have a good outsourcing uh, vendor, say a player like Incorp, for example, that can uh, have the professionals to properly do up your financials. So when you give it to the bank, you have, uh, the bank side has a certain level of confidence that these are not fraud fraudulent uh, accounts. 
Uh, that's the second point. In terms of the third point, I guess bankers like clients who are honest. So when you go to the banker and you tell them, hey, I just need $1 million, that's it. You don't give any uh, purpose to what you would like to do with this $1 million. So if, even if you're cash strapped, right, it's good that you have a plan, a basic plan to tell the bank, hey, for this $1 million, here's a breakdown of what I need to use uh, this $1 million for. So again, it gives the banker certain confidence that you have a plan or action plan or how to use, to use this $1 million to cut through this difficult period. And what is your repayment schedule uh, like or where are your sources of repayment that you can also share with the bank. So again, it gives the banker uh, or the bank's credit approval committee, when they look at the credit proposal put up by the relationship managers, they have a certain confidence that you have thought through on the business of how you're going to repay the bank as well and how you're going to use the money. So bankers do not like SME owners who simply say, I need $1 million to rescue my business. So when you put a statement like this, you're just not going to give a lot of the confidence to the banks that you have the ability to repay. So if they think that you don't have the ability to repay and your balance sheet and P&O does not look good as well, you're likely not to get a loan. So this is the advice I will give uh, to SME uh, business owners. Okay, Kensha. Thanks, Eric. That's a valuable, um, you know, advice for the SMEs who, um, especially now facing some problems on like, you know, getting the loans and stuff moving forward. Okay. Uh, next up, I do have someone uh, on here that's saying that for sole proprietors, you know, who are eligible for SIRS, will they be eligible for the job support scheme in which, you know, um, he, is, he or she is the director slash employee too? So maybe um, you guys can advise for sole proprietors, you know, whether are they eligible for these job support schemes? Mm, Paul? Um, no, if, if, if you're a sole proprietor, then you'll be entitled to SIRS, uh, which is the 3,000, three trenches of 3,000. Uh, the JSS are for employees, and now that with the latest uh, measures, they have extended it to directors who are also shareholders, uh, but provided that these directors last year, that means the last year of assessment, your declared income was less than $100,000. So, so if, uh, well, that, that's the threshold that um, this has been extended to directors who are also shareholders. Because JSS theoretically is to help employees uh, and, and directors who are shareholders are uh, are seen to be uh, more shareholders than, than just a working director. So, so that's that. The, the first trench did not apply to this group of people, but the second uh, enhanced measure, I think on the 21st of April, the DPM Hing actually extended it to directors and shareholders as well. Okay, um, Kenshi, I hope that uh, helps to answer for the soap operators. Uh, who are in our uh, this uh, webinar session down here. Okay, next up, I do have, uh, you know, a question is more on like, you know, commercial uh, lo uh, commercial leasing, everything. Okay, basically their company extended, uh, you know, their commercial rental lease with a private landlord for extra five years in December since last year. Now, you know, with the COVID-19 hitting in, the landlord is unwilling to give tenor, uh, tenor, you know, discount or rebates, except the property tax rebates, which is very so, any advice on how can they negotiate with private landlords to reduce rent or rental waiver? Now, I, I believe just now, Doris, you know, moving forward, you, you did, you know, inform the SMEs that, you know, you can ask to try to negotiate with some of their suppliers and also some of their, you know, payments from um, their, uh, their tenants or whoever down there. So maybe, you know, moving forward, Doris or Eric or you guys, can you advise how SMEs can do the negotiation part, you know, with their landlords or their suppliers or you know their customers who are you know still owning their money and stuff like that what are the things that they really should talk that can help them to increase the success rate of it yeah yes uh any of you paul or eric well i guess uh i guess this is a very difficult question to answer mm -hmm. because one uh, none of us are landlords here <laughs> so so in that case uh, it is still, uh, although the government has introduced uh, certain regulations to try to enforce uh, all landlords to pass on 
um, the rebate that they obtained, uh, the property tax rebate that they obtained from the government, all the way back to the tenants. But there may be also uh, certain situations at the landlord side where they, they, they find it difficult to pass on the, the full savings um, back to the tenants. So, although we are not a law firm here, but yes, getting legal support or legal help uh, in this case, from a law firm, might be one idea. But obviously, for a lawyer who want to uh, do this for you, they will obviously charge you. So uh, the best way that usually that we will recommend, besides going the legal approach, is to essentially uh, uh, have an open communication uh, with the landlord. Uh, in this case, maybe I would like to also put in perspective that uh, the rental, the property tax rebate, uh, or even some properties the total waiver of uh, property tax by the government. Uh, do know that property tax is a percentage of value uh, of the property. So, so we are looking at generally, say, for example, 10%. And so if the landlord is getting 10% uh, of the value of the rebate, which is like, say, rental, uh, even if he uh, totally pass on that rebate, uh, property tax to you, it's it's not like getting um, 10, 30 percent uh, waivers of your monthly rental for, for the rest of the year, that kind of stuff, you know. So uh, this is the misconception that I, I get from talking to clients. So, so it is, uh, it's every, every, every dollar counts and every dollar save is, is helpful, but uh, even when landlords decide and are willing to pass on their property tax rebate to the tenants, uh, it's not that not as material as what you you might perceive it to be. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Eric. Uh, Doris, I think you have any more to add on, or you know what, Eric? Okay. Yeah, I think. I think <laughs> I think what Eric and Paul, um, you know, mentioned uh, is kind co of covered, um, you know, most of it. I think communication is very important to also understand, you know, what's the perspective from the other party at the end of the day. Um, you know, with proper communication and hopefully, you know, especially during this COVID-19 period, it's important to help one another to pull out to pull through this whole period. Yeah, okay. So we don't really have much time, but maybe before our end of the session, let us let us just take one more last question where I have this participants who, you know, is saying that he understands that it's a great to look at cost reduction through areas like process engineering, this falls under efficiency priority. What would any of you suggest on how business can survive this COVID-19 period through an abundance paradigm? Um, the opposite of efficiency paradigm. So, you know, what are you guys, your take on it, you know, or maybe what would you advise SMEs, you know, to think even deeper during this period before we end off the whole session? Thank you, Tiffany. Maybe I'll take this uh, question first. So I, I think this uh, this participant used a very uh, team word called a paradigm or ab abundance paradigm. But I guess uh, for the purpose of all the uh, attendees uh, here today, uh, while we focus on cutting costs or costs that, 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 that we can uh, look upon to, to increase our profits, or uh, uh, looking at uh, what are the type of expenses that we can uh, look to reduce in, in this current juncture, I think the main uh, objective or the main target for all business owners is also to look forward the COVID situation is, will end one day, maybe not tomorrow, but it will end. So which means that you need to plan for the time where this, this, this whole thing will end. So usually when you advise uh, our clients, uh, SMEs or not, where besides uh, uh, trying to tackle the current situation now or rescuing revenue in the one market situation, which is the Singapore market, we also try to suggest the client that, hey, maybe now is the right time. Uh, because there's a, a, lot, a few more time, a lot more time to, to plan for as well, is to consider international extension. Whether you want to bring your business overseas by setting up overseas subsidiaries, open up new markets. When the time opens up, when the economy in the Asia region, Europe region, or even the America region open up post-COVID, right? that's where you have you build up the revenue diversification uh, during this period of time. So this is something that uh, we would always like to encourage uh, clients to consider. Okay, and Paul, for, you want to add on? 
you, yeah, no, no, Paul no. or Doris, you guys have add on, especially, you know, a lot of SMEs also will want to know. So, like, you know, once this COVID 19 situation and, you know, how does Singapore in general, you know, we rebound, you know, into the market as quickly as possible than the rest of the, you know, um, than the rest of the world? So, how do we go about for to prepare our SMEs in this situation? My take on this is that uh, even after COVID 19, there will be a new normal. And the new normal, I am quite certain, will see a lot more digitalization of businesses. So if you are running your business uh, without leveraging too much or as much as should be on uh, cloud-based solutions, uh, technologies, take this time to push ahead for on, on this particular area and, and go in this direction. Yeah. Okay, and Doris, do you have any um, last, you know, comments to add on before we end off this session? I, I just want to add on that during this time, perhaps innovative ideas uh, from the ground is important as well. Um, the way businesses is going to conduct after COVID-19 is really going to be different. And you really have to take that into consideration. Uh, looking at your, really understanding your customers and, as, and project what are the changes that your customers will embark after COVID-19. And that will be able to allow you to reposition yourself. So it's not just yourself, but understanding your customers as well. Okay, Ken, sure. Thanks, Doris. I think, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, business innovation is very important. Uh, as SMEs, we definitely have to be nimble. We definitely have to, you know, be um, on, the, on our toes to always know what our clients are looking for and what is the next wave of business that's coming in so as to make sure that, you know, we can pull through the whole situation and be, the, and be as quickly as possible to rebound everything. So, uh, you know, thank you so much. Thanks, Eric, Doris, and Paul for today's presentation. And thank you, OCBC, for the sponsorship of today's event too. Um, last but not least, I'd like to say that because I understand some of the participants may receive uh, issues on scanning the QR code to fill in their, uh, their information to receive the presentation deck, rest ensure that Singapore Chinese Chamber will be sending off an email to you guys to give you guidance on how to retrieve the presentation deck. Uh, but have, however, do know that you would have to give us a couple of days to make sure that we edit the slides before we send it to you guys. So once again, I would like to thank you guys for you know, enjoying this session and I hope that participants um, you know, has gained a much more valuable insights of today's session. So without further ado, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. So end of the event. Thank you.